All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Arcadia Homestead. This is a property owned by the University of West Florida, and it's managed by the UWF Historic Trust. We are truly on sacred ground here today under this heritage live oak. It is a witness tree, and it witnessed enslaved people living and working here at Arcadia Mill. This is the third time we've hosted this program. We had to take a little bit of a hiatus because of the pandemic, but we're very glad to be back and have you here. This is a partnership between Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site and the Florida Public Archaeology Network. And this was actually created uh, in Tallahassee by Tristan Herrenstein, who came up with this idea and shared it with us here in Northwest Florida. So uh, we've continued on with it, and he's actually hosting them still in Tallahassee, too. Um, this is a way to explore uh, and admire African-American culture, resistance, and experience within the framework of a hush arbor. Funding for this program was provided by the Florida Public Archaeology Network and through a Greater Good Humanities and Academia grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We have a dynamic group of presenters here today, and our hope for this program is that everybody learns something new in a meaningful way that you can share with someone else. All right, so our first speaker this evening is Dr. Nzinga Medsker of Florida A&M University, and she has come all the way from Tallahassee to be here to talk about hush arbors and their significance, because for anyone that doesn't know, I'm sure you're dying to know, because I haven't told you, so she is going to share that with us. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Good to be here. Um, I'm sure most of you know about the um, the tragedy that was the transatlantic slave trade, and what that um, movement of people did was that it brought literally millions of people across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, right now, scholars who have done that work estimate that at 11 million, and I like to say that uh, the transatlantic slave trade did not bring 11 million people. It was a tragedy that happened one person at a time, 11 million times. So when we think about you know, the, the numbers of people who are coming across the ocean, and then we think not only about those individual people, but the people who came after them, who remained in slavery, not only here in North America, but throughout Caribbean America, Central America, and South America. So um, in Southern America and the Caribbean, um, those populations, had the misfortune of being worked most of the time to death on sugar plantations, and they were replaced. So it was cheaper to replace people than it was to create an environment where they could live. Here in North America, the slave population became self-reproducing over um, the first, or let me say the, the second hundred years, people started to self-reproduce, and there were also breeding farms where people were bred as well. So those are some of the reasons why people were able to um, live longer lives here. But um, one of the misconceptions that people have is that as soon as Africans arrived here in North America, that they were converted to slave, converted to Christianity. And that's a widely held misconception. So for the first 100 to 150 years here in North America, enslaved people were largely left to their own devices when it came to their religious orientation. Does anybody know why that might have been the case? Why would Africans brought here not be immediately converted to Christianity by their slave owners? Anybody want to take a stab? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think the Christian religion would have said they could not have slaves. Exactly, exactly. So once they would have converted Africans, then they would not have been able to justify enslaving them because they would have been their Christian brothers and sisters, and it would have been difficult to justify holding them in slavery. So they made a decision, kind of in toto, to not convert them. And so for the first 100 to 150 years, you had waves of Africans coming in, and they were mixing with African Americans. And what was happening was, kind of like a creolization and then a re-Africanization over several generations of the spiritual traditions. And since, particularly here in the South, where we had large plantations, and again, it's also important to remember that most slave owners did not have 
large plantations. Most slave owners own less than 20 slaves. Um, and when we think about that 1% number or that 2% number, that same number of, of people owned plantations of over 100 slaves. So those are the people who made the hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. But on those plantations where there might have been 20, 30, 50, 100 slaves, what enslaved people would do when it came time for their spiritual practice was to fade into the um, forested areas around the plantations. And they would do this at times of the day or rather in the evening or the very wee hours of the morning when their enslavers were not looking for them to work. And so they called these places hush harbors because they had to practice quietly. Now, what I wanna do at this point is disambiguate hush harbor from brush arbor. I think there's some confusion going on there. So a brush arbor is a temporary structure that was built out of brush, kind of like, um, you know how you can buy those pop-up tents now when you go to festivals? So, and, and, and it's like just a shelter on the top. So what they did was they would make shelters like that, but they would make them out of natural materials. So um, trees, and then they would take brush and put them across this. So these brush arbors were used after let's say the first and second Protestant Reformation, when people were having these prayer meetings and revivals, right? So they would put up these brush arbors in public places where they would have maybe a two week revival and people would meet at the brush arbor. That's different from the hush harbor. So in these hush harbors where enslaved people would meet, they would gather, they would sing spirituals, they would practice what um, one of the scholars of this area calls the invisible institution. So his name is Albert Robido, and he calls it the, in the invisible institution because in enslaved people, this was one of the few spaces that they had where they were outside of the purview of their owners and they had a certain amount of physical liberty to do what it was, whatever it was that they did. We have archeological evidence of some of these practices. Um, I think here uh, at the Arcadia plantation, they found a turtle shell and a rock, I believe, or a cement um, a ball. In other places, like in, um, in at the Carroll Plantation in Maryland, at Fort Mose, there's one more place that is escaping me, they found evidence of um, pre-Christian rites that would have involved African spiritual systems or African spiritual orientations towards the world. Um, one of the things that one of the things that I think uh, happens when we think about whatever Africans and African Americans would have been doing during this time period is that we automatically think that whatever it was they were doing was somehow or could somehow be relegated to this idea of superstition, right? That's a word that we hear frequently that is associated with African spiritual systems. However, just like every other uh, ethnic group in the world, African spiritual systems and African practices are based on African philosophical concepts. So, for example, when we think about the person, right? Most of us who went to school, we learn about Plato and Aristotle and how they define the person. They define the person as an individual who is thinking. And then, you know, later on when we get into the Enlightenment period, that individual thinks and therefore he or she is, right? From the African worldview, the individual is a representative and a conglomeration of a corporate identity. Does anybody know what that corporate identity might be? Want to take, anybody want to take a stab? I'll give you one, one guess. So if you're from a place like Pensacola or other, any other small town and somebody says, how your mama now? The corporate identity is your family, right? So this is a practice that we have to this day. Who is in them? <laughs> Who is in them? In them is everybody, right? And even within the context of how your mama and them, it doesn't stop there. So they say, how your mama and them, they fine. How your daddy, he fine. How your grandmama, how your auntie? What about your uncle that used to stay over so-and-so? They fine, they fine, they fine, they fine. And then you get to the business of having the conversation, right? So. This idea of corporate identity is something that enslaved Africans would have utilized in formulating their new identities. Having been removed from their natal land, 
having been removed from their blood ties, they would have come here and they would have immediately starting, started to rebuild connections. And so one of the ways that they did this was through the shipmate relationship. So anybody that you would have come over on the ship with would have been viewed as a relative and they had sex taboos. So you couldn't marry your shipmate because they were literally your family now as you would come through this process together. And this is also something that happened on plantations. Anthropologists call it fictive kin, but we don't call it fictive anymore because people experience these relationships as real relationships, right? Um, another philosophical concept that would have affected the way that people enacted their spiritual practices would have been this idea that everything in the universe is connected and that through that connection flows um, an energy, kind of like, every, Everybody here seen the um, Star Wars, right? The force, right? So the force is an, um, an impersonal, depersonalized energy that flows through, right? And people can use it either for the Jedis or the Siths, right? <laughs> the good guys <laughs> or the bad guys, right? So in African thought, this is very much the same. Everything around us, whether it is the ground, the rocks, the trees, the sky, the rivers, animals, other people, is filled with or is, is, is this energy is flowing through these things, right? So this is why when we see in our archaeological finds artifacts that are used in these practices, the idea behind these artifacts is that these artifacts embody a certain kind of force that can be used to be able to affect a change in the universe. So one of the ways that I like to explain it to my students is by thinking of a spider web, right? If you touch something over here on the spider web, in one corner of the spider web, what happens to the whole spider web? The whole vibration moves through the entire spider web. So this is the philosophical idea that is behind the practices that we see within the African spiritual context. Um, another uh, concept that we can see that's moving through African spiritual concepts would be the, um, the marriage of complementary pairs, okay? So when we think, if I say the word up to you, what are you automatically gonna think? Down. If I say left? White. In? Right. So when we think about these pairs, do we think about them in terms of co cooperating with each other or moving in tension with each other? We think about them in terms of moving in tension with each other, right? In African spiritual concepts, we see these um, pairs as complementary and as working together. So white works with black, up works with down, left works with right, male works with female, right? And it is the operation of these pairs that are functioning that makes the whole world go, go round, right? So these are the concepts that we would have seen being embodied in the practices in the Hush Harbors. One of the most famous practices that we know through um, primary sources, so through interviews, et cetera, that would have taken place in the Hush Harbors is a ring shout. Everybody heard of a ring shout? So a ring shout is basically a, um, it is a circle of people who are moving, they weren't allowed to say that they were dancing because on some plantations, dancing wasn't allowed. So they had to call it a shout. And what they would do was they would sing and they would move in a circle, right? And they would sing their spirituals and they would dance and clap in a circle while somebody had a stick and kept time. And people were like, oh, they're just dancing in a circle. You know, whatever, they're moving around in a circle. The circle represents the unity of the cosmos, right? And the reason why they used to dance in a circle counterclockwise, because in African philosophy, time actually moves backwards in a circle or a spiral rather than forwards in the Western concept from the past to the present and the future. And you're like, well, how the heck does it move backwards? I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> so there is a scholar by the name of John Mbiti and he has kind of distilled African time for us into two categories. One is called Zamani, and one is called Sasa. Sasa is the immediate present. It is the immediate past, right? 
and the short-term future. Zamani is the long-term past, right? So when we think about the immediate present moving into the immediate past, this circle is going counterclockwise. It's going backwards, okay? And then what happens eventually is that time, which is sacred time, spirals into a larger circle, which is like the dream time. If you've ever heard of Australian Aborigines talk about the dream time. So this is the time, like if we were to make an equivalent, we would say this is the time that Adam and Eve exist in, right? This is the time of the beginning, except it's not over, it still exists. And so this is the Sasa. So when you have Sasa moving towards the great past, time is moving backwards. And so when we have that concept happening in the here and now, people dance that circle counterclockwise because they're remembering that time moves towards the ancestors. It's not moving, in, it's not moving forward towards the indefinite. It's moving backwards towards the great past, towards the ancestor. And that's why the ring shout is danced counterclockwise. Right? If you want to know more about this, there's information on the Congo Cosmogram that talks about the counterclockwise of movement and also Dr. Uh, John BT and his um, Zamani and Sasa. Other um, concepts that would have been enacted in the Hush Harbor would have been um, the idea that in that circle of time, we come and we go, right? So African philosophy, just like Eastern philosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, sustains an idea of reincarnation. And um, as quiet as it's kept, because everybody talks about the Haitian Revolution, but don't nobody really understand why the Haitian Revolution was a problem. And part of the reason why the Haitian Revolution was a problem was because 90% of the people who fought in the Haitian Revolution were born in Africa. Why was that a problem? Because they had a worldview that said, if I die, I'm just gonna come back and <laughs> kick your behind tomorrow. <laughs> so we gonna keep on fighting. You can't kill me, okay? So they had this idea that I can't die. And so long as I'm fighting for my liberation, the only thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna go recycle back through Africa and I'm gonna come back and keep on fighting. So this idea that when we practice, when we bury, right? When we bury the dead or when we bury our loved ones, they go back home. And then if they go back home and their mission isn't fulfilled, they're just gonna come back and fulfill their mission. So we don't necessarily have as many written documents about what exactly transpired in these hush harbors. But we, what, what we do know from the archeological evidence and from the firsthand accounts of people who talked about these things and also from people who perpetuated these traditions, right? So we do still have people who do ring shouts. We do still have people who clap and stomp in church. And this is one of the things that blended into African-American uh, Protestantism that, has it, that makes it distinct. It is these practices, it is these beliefs. This is why we catch the Holy Ghost in church. This is why we shout in church because it comes out of this worldview and out of this paradigm. And these are the practices that gave birth to and gave rise to African-American uh, Protestantism and that are so finely chopped and so blended that we don't always know that behind these practices is African philosophy and African ideology. So that's what a hush harbor is versus a brush arbor. And I hope that was edifying for you. Oh yeah, let me get out of that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Metzger, for sharing that wealth of knowledge. Next, we are going to have an artistic demonstration by the Ioka African Drum and Dance Group. So if everybody kind of wants to turn their attention to over here, they can get started.
I hope everybody really enjoyed that. Um, our last presentation for the evening is by Kazmer Rosecki of the National Park Service, and he is going to discuss his efforts to place local landmarks on the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And just to note that some of the content that he will talk about is difficult history, um, so just bear that in mind, but it, it is history nonetheless, and it's something that we prioritize here um, to make sure we're sharing it with everyone. So, Kazmer? Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right. Uh, so good evening. My name is Kazmar Rosecki and I'm a park ranger with the National Park Service at Gulf Islands National Seashore. Uh, before I begin, I wanna thank the Florida Public Archaeology uh, Network, the University of West Florida Historic Trust and Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site for hosting this program and for inviting me to speak before you. Uh, as a, a ranger, one of my responsibilities is to give voice to people who can no longer tell their stories. Uh, and over the past two years, I've worked with a team at Gulf Islands to elevate the voices of freedom seekers who travel the southern extension of the Underground Railroad. Uh, using primary source documentation, we compiled powerful, complex, and emotional accounts of freedom seekers who resisted enslavement in this region. Uh, evidence yielded from these accounts led to the inclusion of not one, but so far three sites, uh, Fort Pickens, the Fort Barrancas area, and Pensacola Pass to the um, National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program. Uh, and as of today, these three sites, as far as I can tell, are the only verifiable underground railroad sites in West Florida. And it's my hope that this won't be all. I hope it's uh, maybe just the, the beginning with more designations to follow. Uh, I should also note that the Archaeology Institute at the University of West Florida played an important role 
uh, in leading to the designation of Pensacola Pass as a uh, transportation route on the Underground Railroad. And as far as I can tell, Gulf Islands National Seashore, as of now, may contain the most Network of Freedom designations of any national park in the United States. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Network of Freedom, uh, it was created by Congress in 1998. The network's mission is to collaborate with local, state, and federal entities, as well as individuals and organizations, to honor, preserve, and promote the history of resistance to enslavement through escape and flight, which continues to inspire people worldwide. As of today, there are over 695 locations across the United States that make up the Network of Freedom. Uh, side note, you don't need to be a park ranger or work at a national park to land one of those designations. Again, this is a program that works with local, state, and federal entities, uh, individuals, and organizations towards those important designations. So there are many myths and popular ideas about the Underground Railroad. Uh, the network defines the Underground Railroad as the resistance to slavery through escape and flight. Uh, though the, fa uh, the, the phrase itself, Underground Railroad, dates to the 1840s, we should all remember that resistance to slavery is as old as slavery itself. So tonight I will share with you the stories of several freedom seekers or enslaved people who took action to obtain freedom from slavery. And I was thinking about this uh, while, while coming to the event. Uh, I know dawn is almost on, or uh, rather, uh, the twilight hour is almost upon us. Uh, soon darkness will blanket this landscape. Um, and many of these stories that I'm about to share with you contain elements of darkness in many ways. Uh, but as I, I learned a few moments ago from Dr. Metzger, there's complementary pairs. So after darkness comes light. So the first story I would like to share with you is about a man named Adam. In June of 1850, a merchant ship carrying timber departed the bustling waterfront of Pensacola, headed south across Pensacola Bay and into Pensacola Pass. Uh, the ship, called the Mary Farrow, uh, sailed through the pass and entered the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, after three days at sea, the ship's captain discovered a stowaway. Uh, the stowaway, an enslaved man from Pensacola, Adam, hoped to gain his freedom by sailing north on the Underground Railroad. Like many enslaved men in Pensacola, Adam's labor was hired or rather rented out uh, to the United States military. Uh, just 21 years old in 1850, Adam labored as a blacksmith in the Pensacola Navy Yard. Adam's enslavers, a JQ and Lucinda Guild, rented out the bondsman for $1 per day and valued him in 1850 at $1,800. Today, that's the equivalent of just over $64,000. And this is a human life. So when he stepped aboard the Mary Pharaoh and into the unknown, Adam did leave behind a mother and sisters. Uh, and in our compilation, uh, his was the only um, individual, he was the only individual who came to us in the 1850 U.S. Census, the slave schedule, when the enslaver identified the number of enslaved individuals that they uh, subjugated uh, through oppression and violence. There was one individual uh, who was not named because that information wasn't collected but there is one individual, a 21-year-old black male, who was listed as a fugitive. Evidence like that tells us that uh, Adam was indeed a freedom seeker. So upon discovering Adam, uh, the captain of the ship, he ordered a keel hauling. This is a, an archaic form of punishment in which the victim was thrown overboard and dragged by rope beneath the ship's keel. The crew, however, intervened and protected Adam for the rest of the voyage, meaning he had allies aboard. So once the ship reached its destination of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 
The commanding officer went ashore in search of officials to seize Adam. Local abol abolitionists, however, soon intervened. Uh, and after a brief but suspenseful struggle, took Adam ashore. Once ashore, local agents of the Underground Railroad helped guide Adam to Canada. A month after uh, Adam arrived in Portsmouth, Congress passed the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. This act required that enslaved people be returned to their enslavers, even if they were in free states like New Hampshire. The act also made the federal government responsible for finding, returning, and trying freedom seekers like Adam. Let's go forward in time to 1861, the first summer, or the rather, uh, prior to the first shots of the Civil War, eight unknown individuals approached U.S. soldiers garrisoning Fort Pickens out on the west end of Santa Rosa Island. These freedom seekers approached the fort on March 12, 1861. That's notable because it was eight days after a man named Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as the 16th president of the United States. It's also notable because that's exactly one month before the first shots of the Civil War were fired. We also know because of a report written by the post commander, a Lieutenant Adam Slemmer, that the freedom seekers approached Fort Pickens and the soldiers there hoping to receive protection and freedom. But because of that 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, the lieutenant returned personally each freedom seeker to the city marshal in Pensacola. Anecdotal evidence suggests that these unknown individuals, that their journey originated from the Milton area. So this is another example of freedom seekers traveling south on the southern extension of the Underground Railroad, but their journey, unlike Adams, failed. But that didn't stop more freedom seekers from traveling south to the US soldiers and sailors and Marines encamped in and around Fort Pickens during the Civil War. Uh, in the summer of 1861, the first summer of the Civil War, an enslaved couple met together near an, an Escambia Point, somewhere near Pensacola, of course. Uh, this couple, their name was Peter and Henrietta. Uh, they devised a plan to sail on the Underground Railroad to the fort. Their perilous journey ended successfully around August 1861, coinciding with United States war measures aimed at dismantling chattel slavery. Back in 1851, so 10 years prior to seizing his freedom, Peter labored as an artisan for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, by that time, the Army engineers, a federal contractor, and enslaved laborers had already established a uh, permanent system of seacoast defense on and around Pensacola Harbor. Three new construction masonry forts, including Fort Pickens, Fort McCree, Fort Barrancas, uh, they had all been built and armed. Uh, also, the old Spanish Petria de San Antonio, originally completed in 1797, had been modernized in 1839. Beginning in 1844, enslaved laborers had begun construction of advanced redoubt, all of this through enslaved labor. So when Peter's enslaver, a man by the name of Jasper Strong, hired or rented Peter out, he did so to the Corps of Engineers, and Army engineers would force Peter to labor on Fort Barrancas. Uh, as a master mason, uh, his, his in skills were employed in making uh, and maintaining and repairing Fort Barrancas, uh, and the army rented him at a rate of $3.50 a day. Uh, a few years later, he would go on to labor in the Pensacola Navy Yard. Peter's wife, Henrietta, was not forced to labor on the fortifications or in the Pensacola Navy Yard. Like many enslaved women here in the Pensacola area, she worked as a domestic laborer. Uh, a merchant by the name of Oliver Jenkins enslaved Henrietta in 1861. Uh, and at that time, he rented her out to a boarding house keeper who would go on to charge Henrietta for locking up her chickens. A very small, trivial matter. But for this transgression, the boarding house keeper called on the enslaver to deal with Henrietta. So he physically abused her, quote, with a stout green stick, using it up, 
her arms and shoulders becoming bruised and bloody and swollen, end quote. The next day when the enslaver planned to return to finish her off or, quote, taking satisfaction, end quote, with her, a battered Henrietta fled into the woods. So one can only imagine what Peter and Henrietta thought when they finally met up in the woods just north of Pensacola. Uh, it's hard to imagine what Peter felt when he saw his battered wife. Uh, Henrietta had lived out in the woods, her temporary shelter, her refuge, uh, and survived for a little while on muscadines and oysters. But eventually, Peter would meet up with her and the two would discuss what to do. They had two options, return to oppression and violence or enter the unknown, go into the darkness and hope that light was on the other side. Henrietta, we know, looked to Peter and said, quote, well, let us go, end quote. The two boarded a small skiff, pushed off into Escambia Bay and tried to sail south. But because of Confederate patrols out on the water, they had to return. All of this while under cover of darkness and during inclement weather. They would renew their effort a couple nights later. And that night, while avoiding Confederate patrols, made their way 15 miles over open water and successfully landed on Santa Rosa Island. Two days later, they approached the fort commander, who by that point had already decided that he would not be, as he would put it, a, a tool in returning enslaved people to their enslavers. So once they landed there, they would have temporary safety and temporary freedom. It's on October 15, just six days after witnessing Confederates attack a U.S. camp outside Fort Pickens in what is known as the Battle of Santa Rosa Island, that both Peter and Henrietta began the final leg of their journey aboard a uh, side wheel steamship called the McClellan, bound for New York City. They would land there, but it would take battlefield victories for the United States and victories in the halls of Congress and in the White House to determine what their legal condition would be here in this nation. Going forward in time yet again, one final story I would like to share with you of a man named Henry. In August of 1863, the third summer of the American Civil War, Henry escaped his enslaver's plantation near Sparta, Alabama. Uh, he made it as far as downtown Pensacola, which had been um, really a shell of a community because of years of war. Henry found an empty residence and took up lodging probably enjoying uh, the newly acquired freedom that he had in that town. But one morning he woke up with Confederates surrounding him and a gun pointing at him. Those Confederates would drag him up to Alabama where they would brutally beat him. And then they would carry him on further back to the enslaver's plantation, a woman by the name of Mary Burnett. Uh, for his attempted uh, escape, the enslaver had a tire, a metal bar, fashioned into a torture device and tightly riveted around Henry's right ankle. Uh, the torture device extended below and formed a hook so that Henry could not easily walk. This device was derisively called the Yankee watch key. So with this iron bar and forced to labor by splitting rails, the enslaver in that moment was able to control his body, but they could not control his spirit, which longed to be free. So it's in mid-November 1863 that Henry tries again to seize his freedom. He traveled the roughly 100 miles, mostly at night, uh, crossing streams, and eventually made it to the U.S. Army and camped in and around the Barrancas area. There he found allies who would remove that iron bar from his ankle, and then he would relate his journey, uh, which was captured in part in a U.S. General's letter to his superior and uh, an anti-slavery newspaper uh, printed up in Vermont. But we know a little bit more about Henry because shortly after he made it to Barrancas, he became a U.S. soldier enlisting in an all-black regiment led by white officers called the 14th Regiment Corps d'Afrique, 
which in April of 1864 was reborn as the 86th U.S. Color Troops. Uh, Henry and this regiment would be one of somewhere around 200,000 black men who volunteered to fight for the Union and the dismantling, the destruction, the toppling of human chattel slavery in the United States. Uh, soldiers in this regiment would participate in several campaigns, campaigns, skirmishes, raids, expeditions in this area that history books often overlook. Uh, but there was one expedition to Jackson County, which culminated in September 1864 in the Battle of Mariana. In that expedition, a biracial force of U.S. of black and white U.S. soldiers would take with them uh, 600 enslaved men, women, and children who would follow those U.S. soldiers down the entire length of Santa Rosa Island back to Fort Pickens and Barrancas. As far as I can tell, this is the largest number of freedom seekers to move down the island to the fort. So these stories today are now shared at places like Gulf Islands National Seashore, our nation's largest national seashore. Uh, it's my hope that visitors will immerse themselves in these places and these stories and begin to expose themselves to the nuances of our complex and emotional history here in the United States. And I do appreciate having the opportunity to come before you and share some of their voices, elevate some of those voices for you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Casmer, for that. Um, we're going to have time for questions at the end to so hold that because we're going to actually finish a little early. The sun is being good to us and hasn't quite set. Um, thank you so much for that information and, and for sharing those stories because while it is hard history, it's important history and we have to talk about it. Um, so thank you for that. Our closing spiritual is Jesus Leads Me All the Way. And it's sung by Reverend Goodwin in the Zion Methodist Church Congregation. It's recorded in Johns Island, South Carolina in 1970. And I'm so glad I picked this. I picked it for a reason. And Dr. Medsker talked about a ring shout. Well, this has an example of that. Um, this Gola spiritual is an example of a ring shout, um, a common element of Hush Arbor meetings. Um, moving worshipers into sometimes what might seem like a trance-like state, um, often referred to as getting the power or being filled with the spirit.
As the sun sets on this sacred ground, we hope that you were moved by this program and perhaps you were filled with the spirit. Uh, we are going to continue our mission here at Arcadia Mill to continue to research and talk about the enslaved. There were nearly 100, if not more, enslaved people here living and working at the mill, and we make it a priority to talk about that and interpret it and share it. So we appreciate you attending. I encourage you to connect with us at Arcadia, also with the Florida Public Archaeology Network for any future programs or events that we might have. We appreciate all of our presenters. We can give them a round of hands. Please. This is a phenomenal program, and it wouldn't have been anything without our presenters. So thank you so much. Some of you traveled a long way. And thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, your support coming out to things like this helps us to keep going. So uh, I was fighting the clock with the sun setting, and we've actually ended up a little bit early. And I'm sure some of our presenters would be happy uh, to kind of informally, if people had, I know somebody had a question, um, hopefully this invokes some dialogue. And again, I hope you learned something that you can take away from this and share with someone else. Thank you for coming out tonight, and I hope everyone travels safe. Thank you.